penetration. So let's ask ourselves how to do a good endpoint detection because that's really the, the addition of the titrant is not the problem. Detection of the endpoint is the real problem we've got here. Now we can do um, two kinds of different ways of detection. One's called amphirometric and one's called potentiometric. The potentiometric method, as I just indicated, would be measuring the potential of a working electrode during the course of the experiment. And that would use the Nernst equation to detect equilibrium potentials in the system, typically. The other way to do it is to use amperometric methods. Now let's consider the case of the iron two with using the in-situ generated cerium four titrant. Okay, remember we've got cerium three in solution but we're generating in-situ the iron, the cerium four which immediately reacts with the iron two in the system. Now if we sort of draw some curves for the current potential curves, now these are not really the curves you would see if you did this but kind of as a guide to what you actually kind of think about was, is happening. And so we're going to draw current anodic is being down. And we're going to use a term for called F which is the fraction of cerium 4 added to iron 3 plus initial. So initially we're going to have a F value of zero and if we drew the current potential curves for that particular case we would see something like this where this curve at the negative would be proton reduction. We would get to this curve here and then we would see water oxidation And this particular point would be E0 for iron 2 plus iron 3 plus. Now we don't really need a lot of cerium 3 in the system. We just need enough so that it will be efficiently generated by the process. So all we need is the amount of cerium to be just greater so that it gives the limiting current just greater than the applied amount of current and that's all. We don't need an excess amount because as soon as we make it, it's being regenerated all the time so that it never gets used up until we're completely done with the titration. At that point, it doesn't matter anymore. So let's do our reaction after a short period of time. Let's say F, of S, F is equal to 0.5. Because of the system, we now have generated some iron 3, so our curves will look a little different. And let's see if I can draw this correctly. Something like that. Now we would have some point at the E0 point would be the equilibrium potential because there would be some iron 2 and some iron 3 in solution, half and half in fact. So. So we would see that sort of situation. Now when we completely remove all of the, all of the uh, iron from the system, the curve would look something like this. where now we have in the system an E0 for cerium 3 plus cerium 4 plus. Just at that point where we've completely removed all of the iron 3 
in iron, iron two, we're gonna have now some ability to get some of the cerium four being produced and being stable in the system. Because before that point, all of the cerium four is being used up by the oxidation of iron three. So F equal to 1.0. When we add an excess amount of of um, iron, of cerium. Now we have a little, we can have a little current potential wave for the cerium four plus and three plus, and so we're gonna have a little bit of current that's cathodic as we are in the point where we have some cerium four plus to reduce. And so that's the curve that we would see. These are not very nicely drawn, I'm sorry, but um, that's the kind of the idea. Once we get to the point where we can make some cerium four and have it stay around, we're gonna start to see a curve for that. All right, so let's think about these waves and in, 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 uh, in how we can use these as a, detect, as a detection process. Now the most common indicator type things is to use two identical indicator electrodes. Now indicator just means that there are, they just indicate a potential that, that we're using and I use a small small current is constantly being passed between the two so remember this would be a kind of a system we don't have we don't have instead of a working electrode and reference electrode we would have two identical electrodes here, the, the current, the other two electrodes for doing the constant current coulometry are the same. The detector electrodes are different, all right? So this is be kind of how you might think about having this working out. You'd have a, a meter that would detect the potential difference. We would have a voltage source, a battery for example. A resistor which would allow us to regulate the amount of current passed between those two electrodes. And here is our, here are our two indicator electrodes. So at all times, we're gonna have a little current flowing through those two little electrodes. Okay, so what happens when we have a system like so? Let's suppose we're at F equal to zero. There will all, since there's a current flowing between those two electrodes, there's gonna be a potential difference between the two automatically. And what is that potential difference? Well, in order to have current flow at one electrode and current flow at the other, between the two electrodes, we have to have an oxidation on one electrode and a reduction at the other electrode, right? So in order to have a current flow between those two electrodes, we have to have an oxidation reduction and so the potential required, or the potential that's developed across those two electrodes will be whatever potential is needed to make a poten oxidation and reduction occur at each of those two electrodes. Since they're identical, the current levels will be the same on one and the other. So let's look at our curve for F is equal to zero. And I'm drawing it a little bit compressed. F equal to zero, that's be it up in, this sort of region. Well, in order to have one electrode here and one electrode here, the current that we pass, and this would be this would be the current level, right? So the difference in current between those two electrodes is here. One of the one of the electrodes is going to be undergoing a reductive process. The other is going to be going an oxidation process, and together that would supply the current that we need. So the potential difference between those two electrodes now is, is large because there's, a, because there's this plateau region in between, there's a significant potential difference being applied across those two electrodes. because so we have to apply enough over potential to get the reaction to occur at both of those things. So delta E 
which we measure across here, and now is large. What happens when f is equal to, say, some other value? Let's suppose a 0 0.3. Now we have a situation like this. Now the potential is not the same between, as the absolute different potential of the two electrodes is not the same, but the potential difference has shifted. Most of the, you know, remember this potential, this current here is due to all the iron two going to iron three. Now some iron three is in solution, so we have some cathodic branch and some anodic branch here. The current that we need now is supplied by this particular difference. It's the same delta I as before. Let's call that delta because that's really what we're interested in. That difference in current is there. Notice the delta E has dropped to very small values now compared to before. Because we don't need a lot of potential difference to get that current to flow. When we're at F equal to one, now we have the opposite situation. All of the iron two is gone. We're only in the iron three zone, and so we don't really have an equilibrium point anymore like we did at point three. Again, we don't have an equilibrium point there that's very well defined. Now we have the current potential curve for the iron two, three, and we have the current potential curve for the iron, our cerium three, four, and the delta E now becomes large again because the delta I has to span those two points. So if we plot, <coughs> and in a similar situation, sorry, right, going off the page here, a similar situation is F is greater than one. Now we're gonna be in a situation like so again, the delta E becomes small, delta I same as before. So if we plot delta E versus F, where F is the degree of completion of the reaction, when F is equal to one, the titration is complete, we get curves that look like this. We get a nice sharp peak right at the F equal to one point. And the minimum is right at point, oh, point 0.5. You see that idea? So by looking for that peak, right at the point where that peak occurs, we can know we're exactly at the, the uh, end point of the titration. We can also look for a minimum, which is kind of shallow, but we can sort of have an idea where the end point is going to occur by looking at the minimum and you say, okay, we're half done, so we can have some predictive idea of when the end point is actually occurring, so we might be able to do some different things to get that uh, end point determined more accurately under those, in the, in those cases. Now we're applying a current here between two electrodes, but often what happens is that they'll use a little reference electrode and a little working electrode instead of two in identical electrodes. The, the results are almost the same under those conditions. The, uh, you still get a peak right at the uh, end point of the titration. So that nice peak is a very accurate way to detect the endpoint. Unlike just looking at the Nernst potential, which gives you a very broad change in potential, which you, you don't really know exactly when the endpoint is occurring. All right. uh, I, I wrote amperometric, but it turns out this is all a potentiometric method. It's potentiometric because I always use the word potentiometric when we refer to a potential measurement at those two electrodes and we, that's what we've done. <clears throat>
Uh, let's, let's look at the other method called ampere metric. And uh, the idea here is we're going to apply a potential difference. between two electrodes. Again, the idea is the two current, the two electrodes for current generation are separate and we're having these two separate electrodes for detection in the cell at another place. The idea is the same, is now except that we instead of using a current, applied current difference, we apply a small potential difference and we measure the current flow between the two. We use a current meter, two indicator electrodes that we've applied a potential difference to. What happens now? Well, let's look at the curve first and we can see what happens. This is the curve of I versus F. at 0.5, a nice sharp drop at 1.0, and there's another drop at zero. So again, this gives you probably a little bit more information. That peak is a little bit easier to identify at the halfway point in this drop to zero is a nice way to detect. It actually doesn't necessarily drop to zero, depend, only in the ideal case does it, but it, it does go to a minimum and, and start up again. So you often, when you go to minimums and going up again, it's easier to detect electronically than going to a maximum and dropping off. Your signal to noise is, are better under those conditions. Now, the shape of the curve doesn't always look exactly like this. It depends on if the reaction is reversible. We've assumed reversibility. We've assumed that the concentration of the reactants is such, and so sometimes those are not the same, but the basic idea is you'd get to a minimum here. Let's see if we can think about this qualitatively and why that works. Same idea as before, but we're measuring, applying a little current through there. And so what happens when we've applied a, remember we're keeping the amount of potential the same all the time. So the same situation is occurring, let's, look, let's go back and look at our F equal to zero curve. When we've applied a potential, and I, let's not draw on there, but let's, I'm just gonna indicate on here. No, we could draw on there. We're applying a constant potential like so. There's hardly, there's no current there, right? There's no current there. If we apply the same amount of potential here, then there's a large current flow at F equal to near 0.5 or 0 0.5. Again, if we apply a potential equal to some value, there's no current flow here. Always that potential is gonna span the equilibrium point in the system because um, we're gonna to have to have a symmetric amount of current flow from either electrodes to get that reaction, the potential is applied. So you can see here when we're close to 0.5, we're gonna get a maximum amount of current. As we're going to the end point, we'll get the minimum amount of current through the system. Same idea as before, no, really no difference. Uh, sometimes it's easier to, to measure the potential, sometimes it's easier to measure the current. Notice, however, that you can take both of these, use two little platinum electrodes and do the same amperometric or potentiometric type detection using the same sets of electrodes. All you have to do is switch a potential meter and a, and a, and a resistor in the system using a set of switches and um, that's easy to do. So there, often you'll have coulometry detectors that have both of these capabilities directly. Now, sometimes the system is not the, the same as this because the reaction assumes reversibility. It's not often the case that it's reversible. And this is often tells you when you might wanna choose a different sort of amperometric or potentiometric type detector. Let's look at the Carl Fisher titration. Now, Carl Fisher titrations have been doing the same method for quite a while. There are some new types of reagents and so I'm not sure this really applies anymore, but I think it's essentially the same as it used to be. What the Carl Fisher is, is, help, is asking you to do is to trying to detect the amount of um, water in the system, generally. And it uses pyridine 
and methanol as a solvent. And it uses iodine and sulfur dioxide as other reagents in the system. So it's a pretty nasty mixture of material, something that's not very pleasant to work with. The idea in the Carl Fischer titration is that you take the methanol and you react it with the sulfur dioxide in the presence of pyridine. Oops, CH, C. 5H5N, that forms this reagent called monomethyl sulfide plus the protonated pyridine. This monomethyl sulfide is oxidized by iodine or triiodide ion. Now, the amount of water in the system is going to be reflecting how much of that reaction actually occurs because water is required to do this reaction. Plus two pyridines going to this sulfate species plus iodide plus protonated pyridine again. Cripes, I can't draw. All right. So what's the coulometric part of the system? Well, we can use coulometry to detect the amount of iodide that we've produced. The amount of iodide that's produced, you can see, is directly related to the amount of water. There's a quantitative relationship, the stoichiometric relationship there. Two iodides that is produced from one mole of water. So by detecting the amount of iodide, it gives us a proxy for determining the amount of water that we had originally in the system. That's how our Carl Fischer reaction occurs. Well, if we generate I, I triiodide ion, it is generated by oxidation of iodine, iodide, I should say. So triiodide. And that reaction is reversible. So when we do our amperometric detection for this system, we get this sort of system. We get this sort of curve. is available, do, does the reaction actually occur? So why is only I3 available at this particular point? Well, the only time we get I3 is when we get I minus being formed. And I minus is not being formed because as soon as it's being made, we're going to we'll return it to iodine in the system. So the Coulometry is the, between the iodine, iodine and the iodide. We're generating the iodide in solution from iodine. I'm sorry, the iodine from the iodide in solution. As soon as all of the water is used up in the system, the reaction has run its course. Now we can start building up some of the um, iodine in solution, and we will now not be able to use up all of the iodide that we've, we've generated. And so we'll start to produce the triiodide ion in that system. 